You boys be quiet down there! Welcome back to PC88 Paradise, the series where we talk about classic Japanese PC games for the NEC PC88, and also discuss how they're related to other classic games that you may be familiar with. If you clicked on this video, you're probably thinking either, what the heck is Burai? Or perhaps you've come across one of the many versions of this game but never really played it. In either case, stick around, because I promise we're going to have a good time learning about this game. Burai Jokan was released in 1989 by River Hill Soft. The Jokan part means that it was the first volume in a two-volume set. Works of Japanese literature are often divided into two volumes called the Jokan and the Gekan, or upper volume and lower volume. Not only does this make it clear that Burai was always intended to be a two-part series, but by using a term which is usually reserved for works of literature, River Hill Soft is implying that the experience of playing this game is going to be akin to reading a long novel. Similar to Falcom games, it looks like this sticker was originally used to seal the case. Inside we have the typical warranty and registration card. Next is a flyer for two Burai music CDs. The text here explains that whereas most games have an original game soundtrack which is sometimes later rearranged on CD, with Burai it was the opposite. The soundtrack for Burai was composed and arranged by the metal band Shouya. You can hear their original arrangements on the CD Burai Prototype. The 10 tracks on that CD served as the basis for the FM synth soundtrack that appears in the game. So next is the manual for the PC-8801 version of the game. It's a simple black and white booklet, and while playing I often found myself wishing it had more information on the spells and equipment in the game. This pink sheet has a few important warnings regarding how to start. Next we have the world of Burai, a full color booklet about the characters and making of the game, which I assume was included with all the PC versions. Whoops, this sheet is a list of corrections to World of Burai that apparently they failed to notice before sending it to the printers. Finally, we get to the floppy disks themselves. Looking at these, you would probably assume that one of the previous owners of my copy decided to throw out most of the floppy disk sleeves and shove all the disks into just two of them. But no, I've looked at images online and it seems this was actually how the game was originally packaged. I can tell these are also wider than normal floppy sleeves in order to easily accommodate multiple discs. The adventure spans a total of 9 epic discs. So first let's watch the opening by inserting discs 1 and 2. This is easily the longest opening sequence I've ever seen in a game this old. It uses the entirety of the first two game discs and clocks in at just over 37 minutes long. In 1989, this game must have unofficially held the record for longest opening sequence. Let me know in the comments section if you can think of any game with a longer opening sequence from 1989 or earlier. So this is really impressive and all, but to be honest, for me it really starts to drag part way through. Burai is an epic story, and it absolutely deserves an opening this long. But it's really hard to become invested in the story and characters before you've even figured out whether you like the game or not. I was actually able to appreciate the opening a lot more after having played partway through the adventure. The gist of the opening is that the main villain named Bido and his henchmen have revived the God of Darkness. However, eight floating jewels were released, which will seek out eight legendary jewel warriors to protect the god of light and restore peace to the land. The main portion of the opening is introductions for each of these eight jewel warriors. After the 37 minute opening is over, we're told to insert disc 3, which is the main disc of the game, and press reset. Finally, we get to the main menu. First things first, let's go to the third option and copy the user disk, which is also actually disk 3. You'll notice it's the only disk that has write protection disabled. I'll go ahead and create a copy and use that instead of the original. Next I'll go to start a new game, which erases all the current saves on the disk. Let's do that to make sure we are starting from the very beginning, which presents you with a choice of 7 different playable scenarios. You may be asking, why are there only 7 scenarios when there are 8 jewel warriors? Well, you'll soon see that one of the scenarios is a double whammy. 
It's worth mentioning that Burai technically came out a few months prior to Dragon Quest IV, which is a game much more well known for its multiple character scenarios, though of course both games were probably in development at the same time. So I played through each of the scenarios in order from top to bottom. However, Hayate's scenario at the top turns out to be a real doozy, and I think it'll be easier to explain later. So let's go instead to the next one, the plot siblings, Gonza and Mai Mai. Back in the opening sequence, they were introduced as two cat-like humanoid creatures. At first I thought they looked like humans wearing cat pajamas, but I later noticed that the only thing that isn't part of their bodies is their hoods. Upon selecting their scenario, we're asked to insert Disc 5 and Drive 2. We find ourselves unceremoniously dumped into the overworld of the game. I think it would have really helped the pacing if each character's introduction was shown here after selecting their scenario rather than making them all part of the overly long opening. I later learned that this is exactly what they did when they later remade the game for consoles. Each scenario of Burai is like a mini RPG with its own unique island to explore. Each character also has their own BGM theme that plays throughout the scenario. You're hearing Gonza and Mai Mai's theme now. Burai is a standard turn-based old-school JRPG, but where to start explaining all the game's unique quirks? Well, it won't take long to get into a battle since this game has quite a high encounter rate. Burai has a fast-paced battle system where you often fight large groups of enemies, even with just one or two characters in your party. Most of the time, unless you want to use spells or items or something, you can just select all attack to make things go faster. You'll notice that there's enough space for up to 8 characters in your party at once. Hey, there's that number again! That's the same as the number of jewel warriors. You'll also notice that there are no numbers here indicating your character's HP or MP. Instead you have these awkward circles which get smaller and crack as your various stats deplete. I guess they did this since this game has a lot of different stats which can frequently change during battle, and they couldn't fit all the numerical values. I soon learned that there's definitely a reason why most RPGs choose to use numbers instead. I got used to this game by necessity, but definitely still would have preferred to just see how much HP and MP I actually have during battle. You have to open the stats menu outside battle in order to see the actual numbers. Another weird thing is that when all your characters go down, you are simply kicked out of battle with no HP left. You then have to heal at least one of your characters before the next battle or you'll get game over. This can definitely be used to your advantage as I'll show later. The only exception is when fighting a boss, where you simply get game over as soon as you lose all your HP, like in any other RPG. By the way, there are certainly some weird looking monsters in this game. To me, these look like green monster hands flipping you the bird, and these guys... Next, let's go back and explain a couple things I should have done before even getting into battle. Gonza and Mai Mai start with some equipment in their inventory, but for some reason you have to manually equip them yourself. This definitely wouldn't be the case in any modern RPG. Another weird thing is the action system, which is the third choice in the menu. This allows you to select one stat for each character to practice. That stat will then increase automatically as the party walks around. By default, each character practices nothing, so you definitely want to change this right away. If you don't have each character always working on raising a stat, it's a huge waste. The first town is located just to the north of Gonza and Mai Mai's starting point. Here we have more weirdness to explain. Instead of just having an inn to restore all your party members to maximum stats, in this game you can pay 20 gold to heal one party member or 50 to heal all. And regardless of which you choose, it doesn't restore everything to 100%, but rather just a little bit each time. You have to pay several times in order to fully restore every character. This is another thing where you can see there is definitely a reason why every other game chooses to handle it the normal way. Next, let's go to the equipment shops. Burai has no limitations on which equipment each character can equip. Instead, you have a suitability score for each one with each character. If a piece of equipment isn't suitable, it won't add much to that character's attack or defense. How do you know whether it's suitable before buying it? Simple, the shopkeeper tells you. Ideally, you want to use only equipment with a suitability score of 5, which is the maximum. But 4 is acceptable if nothing better is available. If you don't like RPGs that require a lot of grinding, then you're probably not going to like Burai. 
In each scenario you start off with extremely weak characters and you're going to need to spend a lot of time near the first town raising experience and also money to buy good equipment before you set off. If you are, however, someone who enjoys the simple pleasure of seeing your party get gradually better, then you're going to love Burai. Each stat can be raised independently from the character's overall level, and you are constantly bombarded by messages informing you when a character's stat has leveled up. Yeah, love that dopamine rush. This is way better than touching a treasure chest on your smartphone screen and being rewarded with a prize inside, isn't it? Isn't it? Well, I think it is anyway. But next, let's talk about what I think is probably the single biggest issue with Burai, as well as every port of it. When your characters are new and weak, keeping them alive can literally start to turn into a losing battle. In fact, you'd better be pretty careful about when you save your game to make sure you are not saving yourself into an impossible situation. Battles often give very little gold, and restoring your HP is expensive. Run out of HP, gold, and healing items, and your adventure might be over for good. Additionally, a couple of scenarios have characters like Mai Mai here who can't take more than a couple of hits before they're done. This can be mitigated a little bit by having them practice Perseverance, which is this stat here. But anyway, let's move on. When you're ready, walk just a bit toward the right side of the map and you'll enter the first story sequence of this scenario. There are little cutscenes like this peppered frequently throughout the game. The amount of character graphics and dialogue is really incredible for 1989. This is maybe one of the earliest games truly deserving of the term story RPG, long before Falcom and others started using the term. Even besides the opening, some of the cutscenes are so long that I sometimes started to wonder when they were going to end so that I could go to the bathroom or start making dinner or whatever. So in this first cutscene, Mai Mai is kidnapped. Yeah, I hope you didn't bother buying her any equipment, cause for the remainder of this scenario you will be playing Gonza only. Oh well, Mai Mai was too much work to keep alive anyway. To save Mai Mai, Gonza has to go to the enemy base in the northeast corner of the map, and make his way through the dungeon within. After he defeats a boss and rescues Mai Mai, we see the epilogue of Gonza and Mai Mai's scenario where they set off to join the other jewel warriors. Before starting the next scenario, I recommend making a copy of your user disk. As I mentioned, it's really easy to accidentally save yourself into an unrecoverable state, and then you would literally have to reinitialize your progress on all seven scenarios in order to get a second shot at the one scenario where you screwed up. So it's good to have a user disk that will allow you to go back to the beginning of the scenario you're currently working on. It takes about two minutes to copy the disk, which is a long time, but I recommend doing it between each scenario anyway. For a while, I thought it would be a good idea to just have a second user disk ready, and then after starting each new scenario to just use the in-game save option to save to multiple user disks. This is much faster, but don't do this. When you use the in-game save option, it only saves your progress in the current scenario. It doesn't save which scenarios you've already completed. The only way to back up that progress is by using the disk copy option in the main menu. Due to my screwing around with multiple user disks in the save feature, I actually ended up having to redo one of the scenarios I had already cleared. So now let's return to Hayate's scenario at the top of the list. Although this was actually the scenario I did first, it's the hardest in the game and very easy to save into an impossible situation. I had to restart this scenario from scratch a total of four times before I got it right. Luckily it isn't very long. You start on the fifth floor of a five floor dungeon and just have to make it to the entrance on the first floor where you'll fight two bosses. What makes this a difficult task is that there is no way to recover your HP other than healing items. Once you're out of healing items you're pretty much just waiting to die. There are a couple of cabinets that contain a bunch of potions, but other than that you have to just hope that the enemies will drop some and this seems to happen only once in a blue moon. Hayate will find three of his pirate companions trapped in the dungeon, giving you a total of four characters to try to keep alive. You can have them practice the Perseverance stat so that they will take less damage, but an even better idea is to choose Search the Area here instead. What this actually does is raise your Curiosity stat. Sounds like a worthless stat, doesn't it? But raising it increases the item drop rate after battles, which makes a huge difference in Hayate's scenario, and is actually extremely useful throughout the game. Curiouser and curiouser. Another mistake I made is not realizing that the enemies get progressively harder as you descend toward the lower levels of the dungeon. 
Once you have all four characters, you want to return to the top two levels and fight the weaker enemies there until you get stronger and accumulate some dropped healing potions. Then you can make an attempt at the bosses on the ground floor. In the epilogue of this scenario, one of Hayate's pirate companions named Jack is mortally wounded. He gives Hayate his headband and asks him to give it to his daughter Lillian if he should ever find her. I'm not going to talk about all of them in this much detail, but here are some story highlights from the other scenarios. Things are going to get pretty spoilery hereafter, so if you're planning on playing this game yourself and really don't want to spoil anything, you can skip to the time shown on the screen now. Lillian Lancelot is a sorceress who is looking for a boy she was engaged to be married to since childhood. Have you seen this boy? She agrees to become a jewel warrior, but only after she visits a famous fortune teller nearby to ask about her fiancé. The crystal ball shows Lillian's father dying, and she mistakenly believes that Hayate killed him. Why, oh why, Hayate, did you have to put your hand on that knife? She swears to avenge her father when she finds the boy she saw in the ball. In the Low Tam family scenario, the father has agreed to become a jewel warrior, but first he needs to leave his wife and child in the care of a friend in another village. The friend betrays him and tries to sell his wife and child to the enemy army. After a botched rescue attempt, only the young boy, Kook, survives. Kook then takes his father's place as one of the jewel warriors. Ho ho, what a Kook! The other characters are Sakyo Maboroshi, an immortal dragon god who has temporarily lost his divine powers, and Romal Sebastian VII, a lizard-like humanoid creature from a wealthy family of noblemen. Alec Heston is a fortune teller, observing each of the jewel warriors through his crystal ball along with the bad guys. The part of Alec Heston will be played by my brother, Neo Alec. Come on, old man, show me the last warrior. I see. I see. Hurry up. Show me. The last warrior. The last warrior is... me. Hey, I thought you were on our side. I never said I was. Ho 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 ho. So long, suckers. Alec is my favorite character and scenario. He has overpowered attack magic that affects all the enemies on screen, as well as a decent regular attack and defense. The dungeon in this scenario is also really fun. As for the character of Alec, the way he often breaks the fourth wall can be funny and really works for me in this game. So if I rescue your brother, maybe you'll give me some kind of legendary sword. Or maybe a hint to progress the story? No, I'm afraid I can't give you any reward. So this event isn't related to the main story? What are you talking about? Never mind. This scenario ends with Alec fighting his arch-rival, a wizard named Hassam. They're having a wizard's duel! After Alec deals him a fatal blow, it's revealed that Hassam was Kook's grandfather. He gives Alec his bracelet and tells him to give it to Kook's father when he sees him. He doesn't know that Kook's father died in the other scenario. After all seven scenarios, the eight jewel warriors are finally gathered together. Lillian is infuriated to learn that Hayate, who she thinks killed her father, is one of the eight warriors. She decides to hide her real name from the others and bides her time until she can take her revenge. Next, when Kook sees Alec wearing his grandfather's bracelet, he mistakenly believes that Alec is his grandfather, who Kook has never met, by the way. Wait, I'm not your... Oh well, I guess I'll just go along with this. Ho ho, what a kook! During the second half of the game, with eight characters in your party, the battle system really begins to shine. You get eight attacks each turn to take out the hordes of enemies, and the speed of the battle system stops things from becoming too tedious. At least with my playing style, I found my man Alec to be the clear MVP. His overpowered magic attacks carried my party through the rest of the game. Stand back, everyone! I'll handle this. So what to do now that all eight warriors have gathered? Look for eight pieces of legendary equipment, hidden in eight dungeons, of course. The first three in the southern part of the map can be taken down in any order. Then you can do this one, and then the four dungeons in the upper regions of the map, again in any order. 
Once you have all the legendary equipment, you can finally confront the final boss in the castle near the center of the map. I know I'm making this sound really simple and dry, but in actuality each one of these dungeons is loaded with story development told through dramatic cutscenes. Each of the eight protagonists will be thoroughly tested both physically and emotionally before they can obtain their respective equipment. Here are some more story highlights. It's revealed to the player, but not Lillian, that her childhood fiancé is actually one of the bad guys now, but their fateful reunion apparently won't happen until the second game. There's also a scene where Hayate fights his mom, yes his mom, who had her memory erased and was turned into a winged monster by one of the bad guys. Just when it looks like Hayate is about to be killed by his own mother, Lillian throws a needle and saves him. Lillian is troubled by her actions, but she reasons that Hayate killed her father and now she has killed his mother, so in a way they are even. Lillian has also gotten to know Hayate a lot better by this point and has begun to question whether he actually killed her father or not. The game itself still has plenty of curveballs in store for the player. Besides the 8 pieces of legendary equipment, all the best equipment in the game is very hard to find without a walkthrough and requires you to have your curiosity stat raised to a certain level. Some of the best equipment is sold at these hidden shops, while others can be picked up in this empty desert in the middle of the map. Others are sold by wandering merchants, who will only appear when you walk on a specific spot. Still others are only dropped by these boss-like enemies which can be encountered randomly. By the later dungeons, I had adopted a bit of a cheap strategy for getting through the game. You can exploit the fact that you don't get game over right away even when all characters are taken out. After losing a battle, I just used Lillian's healing magic to give each character a bit of HP back, and then I was able to move forward until the next battle encounter. You still get some experience even when you lose, and I was even able to win some of the battles with only a bit of HP, so this isn't quite as cheap and defeatist a strategy as it may sound. You could just call it faking it until you make it. The final dungeon of the game is tiny, but the enemies are super difficult. I used my cheap strategy to move toward the end boss, who is Darl, the god of darkness. I restored all my HP and then used a ton of healing items during the battle to try to keep as many characters alive for as long as possible. Eventually this paid off. One more spoiler warning here just in case you don't want to see how the game ends. But I want to see what happens. You know what happens. They find Captain Cook's treasure. All the elves dance around like little green idiots. I puke the end. In the ending, the main villain, Bido, destroys the God of Light, and Burai is opened. It turns out that Burai is short for Bujin Raiodo, the passageway for a new god to ascend to heaven when there is a vacancy. So Burai is literally the stairway to heaven. Wait, no, there's no stairway. No stairway? Denied! It's also revealed that Bido himself is the one who wrote the legend of the Eight Jewel Warriors thousands of years ago, and that the true purpose of the Eight Warriors was not to restore peace to the land, but rather to open Burai for Bido all along. Bido is the son of the God of Light, and heir apparent to the throne. Our heroes are desperate to stop Bido from passing through Burai and becoming a god. They hate him. Sakyo explains that Burai can only be closed through the sacrifice of a god such as himself. However, the god of darkness decides to save Sakyo by sacrificing himself instead. Burai closes before Bido can enter. It flings him and his men somewhere far away, leaving only our eight heroes behind. With both gods of light and dark destroyed, the heroes determine that the world can be at peace for now. They say goodbye to their jewels and each of them go their separate ways. Kook goes along with Alec, who he still thinks is his grandfather. Hoo hoo, what a kook! And Lillian decides to join Hayate as he returns to his pirate life. She still thinks that Hayate killed her father and hasn't revealed her real name to him yet, but they appear to be the hot new couple going into the sequel. It was also revealed earlier that, unbeknownst to Hayate, his father was also a god and this will definitely be an important fact to know when Burai inevitably opens again in the next game. And that's Burai, or part one of it anyway. Burai was an ambitious game. Yes, I think ambitious is the right word to describe it. You can tell the developers wanted to tell a story, and never did I imagine that a game with this level of storytelling was released on an 8-bit computer in 1989. The depth of the story makes me feel like I just played a much newer RPG. 
Another area where they seem to have expended a lot of effort is the soundtrack. The music in Burai is overall pretty good, with plenty of stereo sound from the soundboard too. At times, however, it can have a bit of a harsh FM sound to it. It's the actual RPG elements of Burai where it falters a bit. This was a time when developers were still figuring out what players liked. For instance, the fact that most players like to have a way to instantly restore their party's HP to 100% at certain points. But overall, after I learned the game's quirks, I had a really good time. Sometimes it was fun to feel like I was sort of outsmarting the game, and beating it at its own tricks. So overall, I really like the way that this game turned out on the PC-88, but how did it fare on other platforms? The PC-98 version was released the following month. Aside from some improvements in the menus, this one seems pretty much the same as the original PC-88 version, even utilizing the original low-resolution graphics for all the maps and cutscenes. Next came the MSX2 version in April of the following year. In many ways, I'm even more impressed with this one than the PC-88 version. Despite the limited graphics and hardware, everything is here, and looks almost the same. The music, provided by the MSX's FM pack, sounds surprisingly similar to the original as well. That same month, the game also came out on the Fujitsu FM Towns. Like most FM Towns games at the time, it was released on a CD-ROM. However, only some of the game's music was arranged in Redbook CD audio, and the game lacks any voice acting. The majority of the music is played by the FM Towns' internal FM sound chip. Mouse support was also added. Otherwise, it is pretty similar to the PC-98 version. The console versions of the game have a different subtitle, and could be more accurately described as a remake of the PC games rather than a straight port. I've now played the PC Engine version pretty extensively after finishing the PC-88 game. Most importantly, in the PC Engine version the opening and many of the cutscenes have voices, but all of these sequences have been majorly abridged compared to the original game. The voiceless cutscenes, on the other hand, are more or less the same as the original. The ability to select the order of the different scenarios is no longer present. They're in a predetermined order instead. Overall, I would say the game's system is two steps forward and one step back. The on-screen displays have been seriously upgraded, and it is nice to be able to clearly see your progress on the stats your characters are currently practicing. The battle system has been changed quite a bit. Now your characters will try to attack enemies which are no longer there, like in Final Fantasy 1, instead of automatically attacking the next enemy like they did in the original PC-88 game. Everyone loves that, right? The battle system is slow and tedious until you learn the hidden auto-battle command, which is executed by pressing left and 1 at the attack menu. The battle encounter rate is much lower, and items are dropped much more frequently than in the original game, which often tends to make the game a little easier, but on the other hand, enemies give very little gold, which made me unable to get past the beginning of Alex's scenario in this version. I kept dying before I could obtain enough money to heal. I'm sure it's possible, but I gave up here after a few tries. The other thing that sucks in this version is that the shops don't tell you how suitable the equipment is for each character. This is a major drawback, and means that without a walkthrough, you'll want to save before buying equipment, and then see whether the equipment is suitable by buying and equipping it. The arranged music sounds about how you would expect it to, and there were actually some new tracks added. Even the main battle music is different. However, most of the tracks are so short, it can seem ridiculous. Between using Redbook Audio for both the cutscenes and music, it's like the developers were in a battle to find enough disk space. They should have used more ADPCM for the voices to save room, like they did in the second PC Engine game. Overall, the PC Engine version of Burai isn't unplayable, but I can't really recommend it. If you can, play the Mega CD version instead. It's pretty much the PC Engine version, but with some much needed improvements. It's the only version that completely removes the border and displays the gameplay in full screen. The battle screen has been completely redesigned into a Phantasy Star 2 style interface, which is much more fun to look at. Best of all, characters don't try to attack monsters that are no longer there, like in the PC Engine version. The music and cutscenes are the same, except supposedly some of the voice actors for minor characters have been replaced. This version was apparently programmed by Sega, with minimal involvement from River Hill Soft. 
But River Hillsoft wasn't involved at all in the Super Famicom version, released by IGS. Serious sacrifices were made here in order to make the game fit into a relatively small and inexpensive cartridge. All the cutscenes have been replaced with sequences of the character sprites simply moving around and talking to each other, similar to other Super Famicom RPGs. The battle system looks okay, but not as interesting as the Mega CD version, and the original PC-88 battle theme makes a welcome return. And that's every version. So why is it, do you think, that the original PC-88 Burai made such an impression on me? I think it's primarily because I really like to see game hardware being utilized to its maximum potential. The PC-88 version does this for sure, whereas none of the console versions really stand out on their respective platforms, in my opinion. RPGs were a dime a dozen on both the Super Famicom and the PC Engine CD, and Burai certainly didn't seem to stand out among them. The Mega CD, on the other hand, really didn't have that many RPGs, and Burai can be seen as a welcome addition to the handful of them that aren't lunar. However, despite the improvements over the PC Engine version, Burai clearly doesn't take true advantage of the Mega CD's hardware. Also, as you may have guessed from watching this series, I really enjoy seeing games in their original state, running on the original hardware they were made for, which is why I'm glad that the original PC-88 version is the one that I decided to sit down and play through. So now, of course, I can't wait to play the sequel on my PC-88. What's that? No version of the second Burai game was ever released for the PC-88. Apparently, when they started working on the second game, they decided that the PC-88 was too old and moved to the PC-98 as the primary development platform. It was still ported, however, to the FM Towns and even the MSX2. For consoles, it was remade as Burai 2, but released only on the PC Engine. On a side note, I've been playing this game lately and was surprised to find that it's actually really good, and a far more competently made PC Engine game than the original. They've successfully reworked the second game into a more modern-feeling 16-bit era RPG, made to be played by actual humans. If I could recommend any one Burai game to you, here it is. It's probably the jewel of the entire series. But I digress. The second Burai game really deserves its own video someday if I ever decide to start making a PC-98 paradise. Until then, I hope you'll join me for whatever videos I end up making in the meantime. I want to sincerely thank all of you for sticking with me through this long video, and thank you as always for liking, sharing, and subscribing. This has been Mr. Jakes for Basement Brothers.